Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back to CS224N. So today is a pretty key lecture where we get through a number of important topics for neural networks, especially as applied to natural language processing. So right at the end of last time, I started into recurrent neural networks. So we'll talk in detail more about recurrent neural networks in the first part of the class. And um, we'd emphasize language models, um, but then also getting a bit beyond that. And then look at more advanced kinds of recurrent neural networks towards the end part of the class. Um, I just wanted to sort of say a word before getting underway about the final project. So hopefully by now you've started looking at assignment three, which is the middle of the five assignments for the first half of the course. And then in the second half of the course, most of your effort goes into a final project. Um, so next week, the Thursday lecture is going to be about final projects and choosing a final project and tips for final projects, etc. So it's fine to delay thinking about um, final projects until next week if you want, but you shouldn't delay it too long because we do want you to get underway with what topic you're going to do for your final project. If you are thinking about final projects, you can find some info um, on the website, but note that the info that's there at the moment is still last year's information and it will be being updated over the coming week. Um, we'll also talk about project mentors. If you've got ideas of people who on your own you can line up as a mentor, that now would be a good time to ask them about it and we'll sort of talk about what the alternatives are. Okay, so um, last lecture I introduced the idea of language models, so probabilistic models that predict the probability of next words after a word sequence. And then we looked at n-gram language models and started into recurrent neural network models. So today we're going to talk more about the simple RNNs we saw before, talking about training RNNs and uses of RNNs. But then we'll also look into the problems uh, that occur with RNNs and how we might fix them. These will motivate a more sophisticated RNN architecture called LSTMs. And we'll talk about other more complex RNN options, bidirectional RNNs and multi-layer RNNs. Um, then next Tuesday, um, we're essentially going to um, ex further exploit and build on the RNN-based architectures that we've been looking at to discuss how to build a neural machine translation system with the sequence to sequence and model with attention. And effectively, it's that model um, is what you'll use in assignment four, but it also means that you'll be using all of the stuff that we're talking about today. Okay, so if you remember from last time, this was the idea of a simple recurrent neural network language model. So we had a sequence of words as our context for which we've looked up word embeddings. And then the recurrent neural network model ran this recurrent layer um, where at each point we have a previous hidden state, which can just be zero at the beginning of a sequence. and you have feeding it in to the next hidden state, the previous hidden state, and the encoding and transformed encoding of a word um, using this recurrent neural network equation that I have on the left that's very central. And based on that, you compute a new hidden representation for the next time step. And you can repeat that along for successive time steps. Now we also usually want our recurrent neural networks to produce outputs. So I only show it at the end here, but at each time step, we're then also going to generate an output. And so to do that, we're feeding the hidden layer into a softmax layer. So we're doing another matrix multiply, add on a bias, put it through the softmax equation. And that will then give us a probability distribution over words. And we can use that to predict how likely it is that different words are going to occur after the students open there. Okay, so I didn't, I'd introduce that model, but I hadn't really gone through the specifics of how we um, train this model, how we use it and evaluate it. So let me um, go through this now. So here's how we train an RNN language model. We get a big corpus of text, just a lot of text. And so we can regard that as just a long sequence of words, X1 to XT. Um, 
And what we're going to do is feed it into the RNN LM. So for each position, we're going to take prefixes of that sequence. And based on each prefix, we're going to want to predict um, the probability distribution for the word that comes next. And then we're going to train our model by assessing how good a job we do about that. And so the loss function we use is the loss function normally um, referred to as cross entropy loss in the literature, which is this negative log likelihood loss. So we are going to predict some word to come next. Well, we, we have a probability distribution over predictions of what word comes next. And actually there was an actual next word in the text. And so we say, well, what probability did you give to that word? And maybe we gave it a probability estimate of 0.01. Well, it would have been great if we'd given it a probability estimate of almost one, because that meant we've almost certain that what did come next in our model. And so we'll um, take a loss to the extent that we're giving the actual next word a predicted probability of less than one. To then get an idea of how well we're doing over the um, entire um, corpus, we work out that loss at each position, and then we work out the average loss over the entire training set. So let's just go through that again um, more graphically in the next um, couple of slides. So down the bottom, here's our corpus of text. Um, we're running it through our simple recurrent neural network. And at each position, we're predicting a probability distribution over words. We then say, well, actually, at each position, we know what word is actually next. So when we're at time step one, the actual next word is students, because we can see it just to the right of us here. And we say, what probability estimate did you give to students? And to the extent that it's not high, i.e. it's not one, we take a loss. And then we go on to the time step two. And we say, well, at time step two, you predict a probability distribution over words. The actual next word is opened. So to the extent that you haven't given high probability to opened, you take a loss. And then that repeats for in time step three, we're hoping the model will predict there. At time step four, we are hoping the model will predict exams. And then to work out our overall loss, um, we're then um, averaging our per time step loss. Um, so in a way, this is a pretty obvious thing to do, but note that there is a little subtlety here. And in particular, this algorithm is referred to in the literature as teacher forcing. And so what does that mean? Well, you know, you can imagine what you can do with a recurrent neural network is say, okay, just start generating. Maybe I'll give you a hint as to where to start. I'll say the sentence starts the students and then let it run and see what it generates coming next. Um, it might start saying the students have been locked out of the classroom or whatever it is, right? Um, and that we could say is, well, that's not very close to what the actual text says. And somehow we want to learn from that. And if you go in that direction, there's a space of things you can do that leads into more complex algorithms such as reinforcement learning. Um, but from the perspective of training these neural models, that's unduly complex and unnecessary. So we have this very simple way of doing things, which is what we do is just predict one time step forward. So we say, we know that the prefix is the students, predict a probability distribution over the next word. It's good to the extent that you give probability mass to opened. Okay, now the prefix is the students opened, predict the, a probability distribution over the next word. It's good to the extent that you give probability mass to there. And so at effectively at each step, we're resetting to what was actually in the corpus. So, you know, it's possible after the students opened, the model thinks that by far the most probable thing to come next is ah uh, or the say. I mean, we don't actually use what the model suggested. We penalize the model for not having suggested there, but then we just go with what's actually in the corpus and ask it to predict again. Um, um, this is just a little, um, 
side thing, but it's an important part to know um, if you're actually training your own neural language model. I sort of present it as one huge um, corpus that we chug through, but in practice, we don't chug through a whole corpus one step at a time. What we do is we cut the whole corpus into shorter pieces, which might commonly be sentences or documents, or sometimes they're literally just pieces that are chopped, right? So you'll recall that stochastic gradient descent allows us to compute a loss and gradients from a small chunk of data and update. So what we do is we take these small pieces, compute gradients from those and update weights and repeat. And in particular, um, we get a lot more speed and efficiency in training if we aren't actually um, doing an update for just one sentence at a time, but actually a batch of sentences. So typically what we'll actually do is we'll feed to the model 32 sentences, say, of a similar length at the same time, compute gradients for them, um, update weights, and then get another batch of sentences to train on. Um, how do we train? I haven't sort of gone through the details of this. I mean, in, in one sense, the answer is just like we talked about in lecture three, um, we use back propagation to get gradients and update parameters. Um, but let's take at least a minute to go through um, the differences and subtleties of the recurrent neural network case. Um, and the central thing that's a bit, you know, as before, we're going to take our loss and we're going to back propagate it to all of the parameters of the network, everything from word embeddings to biases, et cetera. But the central bit that's a little bit different and is more complicated is um, that we have this WH matrix that runs along the sequence that we keep on applying to update um, our hidden state. So what's the derivative of JT of theta with respect to the repeated weight matrix WH? And well, the, the answer to that is that what we do is we look at it in each position and work out what the partials are of JT with respect to WH in position one or position two, position three, position four, et cetera, right along the sequence. And we just sum up all of those partials and that gives us a partial for JT with respect to WH overall. Um, so um, the answer for a current neural networks um, is the gradient with respect to a repeated weight in a recurrent network is the sum of the gradient with respect to each time it appears. Um, and let me just then go through a little why that is the case. But before I do that, let me just um, note one gotcha. I mean, it's just not the case that this means it equals t times the partial of JT um, with respect to WH, because we're using WH here, 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 here through the sequence. And for each of the places we use it, there's a different upstream gradient that's being fed into it. So each of the values in this sum will be completely different from each other. Well, why we get this answer is essentially uh, consequence of what we talked about in the third lecture. Um, so to take the simplest case of it, right, that if you have a multivariable function f of x, y, um, and you have two um, single variable functions x of t and y of t, which are fed one input t, well then the um, simple um, version of working out the derivative of derivative of this function is you take the derivative down one path and you take the derivative down the other path. And so in the slides in um, lecture three, that was what was summarized on a couple of the slides by the slogan, gradient sum at outward branches. So T has outward branches. And so you take gradient here on the left, gradient on the right, and you sum them together. And so really what's happening with a recurrent neural network is just uh, many pieces generalization of this. So we have one WH matrix 
and we're using it to keep on updating the hidden state at time one, time two, time three, right through time t. And so what we're going to get is that this has a lot of um, outward um, branches and we're going to sum the gradient path at each one of them. But what is this gradient path here? It's kind of goes down here and then goes down there. But you know, actually the bottom part is that we're just using WH at each position. So we have the partial of WH used at position I with respect to the partial of WH, um, which is just our weight matrix for our recurrent neural network. So that's just one because, you know, we're just using the same matrix everywhere. And so we are just then summing um, the partials in each position that we use it. Okay, um, practically what does that mean in terms of how you compute this? Um, well, if you're doing it by hand, um, what happens is you start at the end, just like the general lecture three story, you work out um, derivatives um, with respect to the hidden layer and then with respect to WH at the last time step. And so that gives you one update for WH, but then you continue passing the gradient back to the T minus one time step. And after a couple more steps of the chain rule, you get another update for WH and you simply sum that onto your previous update for WH. And then you go to HT minus two, you get another update for WH and you sum that onto your update for WH and you go back all the way um, and you sum up the gradients as you go. Um, and that gives you a total update um, for WH. Um, and so there's sort of two tricks here and I'll just mention um, the two tricks. You have to kind of separately sum the updates for WH and then once you've finished, um, apply them all at once. You don't want to actually be changing the WH matrix as you go because that's then invalid because um, the forward calculations were done with the constant WH that you had from the previous um, state all through the network. Um, the second trick is, well, if you're doing this for sentences, you can normally just go back to the beginning of the sentence. Um, but if you've got very long sequences, this can really slow you down if you're having to sort of run this algorithm back for a huge amount of time. So something people commonly do is what's called truncated backpropagation through time, where you choose some constant, say 20, and you say, well, I'm just going to run this backpropagation for 20 time steps, sum those 20 gradients, and then I'm just done. That's what I'll um, update um, the WH matrix with, um, and that works just fine. Okay, so now given a corpus, um, we can train uh, uh, simple RNN. And so that's good progress. Um, but um, this is a model that can also generate text in general. So how do we generate text? Well, just like in our n-gram language model, we're gonna generate text by repeated sampling. So we're going to start off with an initial state um, and um, yeah, this slide is imperfect. Um, so the initial state for the hidden state um, is, is normally just taken as a zero vector. And well, then we need to have something for a first input. And on this slide, the first input is shown as the first word my. And if you wanna feed a starting point, you could feed my, but a lot of the time you'd like to generate a sentence from nothing. And if you want to do that, what's conventional is to additionally have a beginning of sequence token, which is a special token. So you'll feed in the beginning of sequence token in at the beginning as the first token. It has an embedding and then you use the um, RNN update and then you generate using the softmax a next word. And um, well, you generate a prob probability distribution over next words. And then at that point you sample from that and it chooses some word like favorite. And so then 
The trick is for doing generation that you take this word that you sampled and you copy it back down to the input and then you feed it as an, in as an input. Next step, if you are an N, sample from the softmax, get another word and just keep repeating this over and over again and you start generating the text. And how you end is as well as having a beginning of sequence um, special symbol, you usually have an end of sequence special symbol. And at some point, um, the recurrent neural network will generate the end of um, sequence symbol. And then you say, okay, I'm done. I'm finished generating text. Um, so before going on for the um, more of the um, difficult content of the lecture, we can just have a little bit of fun with this and try um, training up and generating text with a recurrent neural network model. So you can generate, you can train an RNN on any kind of text. And so that means one of the fun things that you can do is generate text um, in different styles based on what you could train it from. Um, so here, um, Harry Potter is a, there is a fair amount of a corpus of text. So you can train an RNN LM on the Harry Potter books and then say, go off and generate some text and it'll generate text like this. Sorry how Harry shouted panicking. I'll leave those brooms in London, are they? No idea, said nearly headless Nick, casting low close by Cedric, carrying the last bit of treacle charms from Harry's shoulder. And to answer him, the common room perched upon it, four arms held a shining knob from when the spider hadn't felt it seemed. He reached the teams too. Um, well, so on the one hand, that's still kind of a bit incoherent as a story. On the other hand, it sort of sounds like Harry Potter and certainly in the kind of you know, vocabulary and constructions it uses. And I think you'd agree that you know, even though it gets sort of incoherent, it's sort of more coherent than what we got from an n-gram language model um, when I showed a generation in the last um, lecture. Um, you can choose a very different style of text. Um, so you could instead um, train the model on a bunch of cookbooks. Um, and if you do that, you can then say generate um, based on what you've learned about cookbooks um, and it'll just generate a recipe. So here's a recipe, um, chocolate ranch barbecue. Um, categories yield six servings, two tablespoons of Parmesan cheese chopped, and one cup of coconut milk, three eggs beaten. Place each pasta over layers of lumps, shape mixture into the moderate oven and simmer until firm. Serve hot in bodied fresh mustard, orange and cheese. Combine the cheese and salt together, the dough in a large skillet, add the ingredients and stir in the chocolate and pepper. So, you know, um, this recipe makes um, no sense and it's sufficiently um, incoherent. There's actually even no danger that you'll try cooking this at home. Um, but, you know, something that's interesting is although, you know, this really just isn't a recipe and the things that are done in the instructions have no relation um, to the ingredients, that the thing that's interesting that it has learned is this recurrent neural network model is that it's really mastered the overall structure of a recipe. It knows that a recipe has a title. It often tells you about how many people it serves. It lists the ingredients and then it has instructions um, to make it. So that's sort of fairly impressive in some sense for high level text structuring. Um, so the one other thing I wanted to mention was um, when I say you can train an RNN language model in any kind of text. The other difference from where we were in n-gram language models was on n-gram language models that just meant counting n-grams and meant it took um, two minutes even on a large corpus with any modern computer. Training your RNN LM actually can then be a time intensive activity and you can spend hours doing that as you might find next week when you're training um, machine translation models. Okay, um, how do we decide if our models are good or not? Um, so the standard evaluation metric for language models is what's called perplexity. Um, and what perplexity is, is um, kind of like when you were um, 
training your model, you use teacher forcing over a piece of text that's a different piece of test text, which isn't text that was in the training data. And you say, well, given a sequence of T words, um, what probability do you give to the actual T plus one word? And you repeat that at each position. And then you take the inverse of that probability and raise it to the one on T for the length of your test text sample, and that number is the perplexity. So it's a geometric mean of the inverse probabilities. Now, um, after that explanation, perhaps an easier way to think of it is that the perplexity um, is simply um, the cross entropy loss that I introduced before exponentiated. Um, so, um, but you know, it's now the other way around. So low perplexity um, is better. So there's actually an interesting story about these perplexities. Um, so a famous figure in the development of um, probabilistic and machine learning approaches to natural language processing is Fred Jelinek who died a few years ago. Um, and he was trying to um, interest people in the idea of using probability models and machine learning um, for natural language processing at a time, I, this is the 1970s and early 1980s, um, when nearly everyone in the field of AI um, was still in the thrall of logic-based models and blackboard architectures and things like that for artificial intelligence systems. And so Fred Jelinek um, was actually an information theorist by background um, and who um, then got interest in working with speech and then language data. Um, so at that time, the stuff that's this sort of um, exponential or using cross entropy losses was completely bread and butter um, to Fred Jelinek, but he'd found that no one in AI could understand the bottom half of the slide. And so he wanted to come up with something simple that AI people at that time could understand. And perplexity has a kind of a simple interpretation you can tell people. So if you get a perplexity of 53, that means how uncertain you are um, of the next word is equivalent to the uncertainty of that you're tossing a 53 sided dice and it coming up as a one, right? So um, that was kind of an easy, simple metric. And so he introduced um, that idea. Um, but, you know, I guess things stick. And to this day, um, everyone evaluates their language models by providing perplexity numbers. And so here are some perplexity numbers. Um, so traditional n-gram language models commonly had perplexities over 100. But if you made them really big and really careful, you carefully, you could get them down into a number like 67. As people started to build more advanced recurrent neural networks, especially as they moved beyond the kind of simple RNNs, which is all I've shown you so far, which one of is in the second si line of the slide into um, LSTMs, which I talk about later in this um, course that people started producing um, much better perplexities. And here we're getting perplexities down to 30. And this is results actually from a few years ago. So nowadays people get perplexities of even lower than 30. Um, you have to be realistic in what you can expect, right? Because if you're just gener generating a text, some words are almost determined. Um, so, you know, if it's something like, um, you know, Sue gave the man a napkin, he said, thank, you know, basically 100%, you should be able to say the word that comes next is you. Um, and so that you can predict really well. But, um, you know, if it's a lot of other sentences, like um, he looked out the window and saw uh, something, right, no probability in the model, model in the world can give a very good estimate of what's actually going to be coming next at that point. And so that gives us the sort of residual um, uncertainty that leads to perplexities that on average might be around 20 or something. Okay, um, so we've talked a lot about language models now. 
why should we care about language modeling? You know, well, there's sort of an intellectual scientific answer that says, this is a benchmark task, right? If we, what we wanna do is build machine learning models of language and our ability to predict what word will come next in the context, that shows how well we understand both the structure of language and the structure of the human world that um, language talks about. Um, but there's a much more practical answer than that, um, which is, you know, language models are really the secret tool of natural language processing. So if you're talking to NL, any NLP person and you've got almost any task, it's quite likely they'll say, oh, I bet we could use a language model for that. And so language models are sort of used as a, not the whole solution, but a part of almost any task, any task that involves generating or estimating the probability of text. So you can use it for predictive typing, speech recognition, grammar correction, identifying authors, machine translation, summarization, dialogue, just about anything you do with natural language involves language models. And we'll see examples of that um, in following classes, including next Tuesday, where we're using language models for machine translation. Okay, so a language model is just a system that predicts the next word. Um, a recurrent neural network is a family of neural networks which can take sequential input of any length. They reuse the same weights to generate a hidden state and optionally, but commonly an output on each step. Um, note that these two things are different. Um, so we've talked about two ways that you could build language models but one of them is RNNs being a great way, but RNNs can also be used for a lot of other things. So let me just quickly preview a few of the things you can do with RNNs. So there are lots of tasks that people wanna do in NLP, which are referred to as sequence tagging tasks, where we'd like to take words of text and do some kind of classification along the sequence. So one simple common one is to give words parts of speech. That is a determiner, startled as an adjective, cat as a noun, knocked as a verb. Um, and well, you can do this straightforwardly by using a recurrent neural network as a sequential classifier, where it's now going to generate parts of speech rather than the next word. You can use a recurrent neural network for sentiment classification. Well, this time we don't actually want to generate um, an output at each word necessarily, but we want to know what the overall sentiment looks like. So somehow we want to get out a sentence encoding that we can perhaps put through another neural network layer to judge whether the sentence is positive or negative. Well, the simplest way to do that is to think, well, after I've run my um, LSTM um, through the whole sentence, actually this final hidden state, it's encoded the whole sentence. Because remember I updated that hidden state based on each previous word. And so you could say that this is the whole meaning of the sentence. So let's just say that is the sentence encoding um, and then put an extra um, classifier layer on that with something like a softmax classifier. Um, that method has been used and it actually works reasonably well. And if you sort of train this model end to end, well, it's actually then motivated to preserve sentiment information in the hidden state of the recurrent neural network, because that will allow it to better predict the sentiment of the whole sentence, um, which is the final task and hence loss function that we're giving the network. But it turns out that you can commonly do better than that by actually doing things like feeding all hidden states into the sentence encoding, perhaps by making the sentence encoding an element-wise max or an element-wise mean of all the hidden states, because this then more symmetrically encodes um, the hidden state over each time step. Another big use of recurrent neural networks is what I'll call language encoder module uses. So anytime you have some text, for example, here we have a question of 
what nationality was Beethoven, um, we'd like to construct some kind of neural representation of this. So one way to do it is to run a recurrent neural network over it. And then just like last time um, to either take the final hidden state or take some kind of um, function of all the hidden states and say, that's the sentence representation. And we could do the same thing um, for the context. So for question answering, we're going to build some more neural net structure um, on top of that. And we'll learn more about that in a couple of weeks um, when we have the question answering lecture. But the key thing is what we built so far, we use to get sentence representation. So it's a language encoder module. So that was the language encoding part. We can also use RNNs to decode into language. And that's commonly used in speech recognition, machine translation, summarization. So if we have a speech recognizer, the input is an audio signal. And what we want to do is decode that into language. Well, what we could do is use some function of the input, which is probably itself going to be a neural net as the initial um, hidden state of um, our RNN LM, and then we say start generating text based on that. And so it should then, um, we generate word at a time by the method that we just looked at, um, we turn the speech into text. So this is an example of a conditional language model because we're now generating text conditioned on the speech signal. And a lot of the time you can do interesting, more advanced things with recurrent neural networks by building conditional language models. Another place you can use conditional language models is for text classification tasks and including sentiment classification. So if you can condition um, your language model based on a kind of sentiment, you can build a kind of classifier for that. And another use that we'll see a lot of next class is for machine translation. Okay, so that's the end of the intro um, to um, doing things with um, recurrent neural networks and language models. Now I want to move on and tell you about the fact that everything is not perfect and these recurrent neural networks tend to have a couple of problems and we'll talk about those and then in part that'll then motivate coming up with a more advanced recurrent neural network architecture. So the first problem to be mentioned is the idea of what's called vanishing gradients. And what does that mean? Well, at the end of our sequence, we have some overall um, loss that we're calculating. And well, what we wanna do is back propagate that loss. Um, and we want to back propagate it right along the sequence. And so we're working out the partials of J4 um, with respect to the hidden state at time one. And when we have a longer sequence, we'll be working out the partials of J20 with respect to the hidden state at time one. And how do we do that? Well, how we do it is by composition and the chain rule. We've got a big long chain roll along the whole sequence. Um, well, if we're doing that, um, you know, we're multiplying a ton of things together. And so the danger of what tends to happen is that as we do these um, multiplications, a lot of the time these partials between successive hidden states become small. And so what happens is as we go along, the gradient gets smaller and smaller and smaller and starts to peter out. And to the extent that it peters out, um, well, then we've kind of got no upstream gradient and therefore we won't be changing the parameters at all. And that turns out um, to be pretty problematic. Um, so the next couple of slides sort of um, say a little bit about the why and how this happens. Um, what's presented here is a kind of only semi-formal 
wave your hands at the kind of problems that you might expect. Um, if you really want to sort of get into all the details of this, um, you should look at the couple of papers um, that are mentioned in small print at the bottom of the slide. But at any rate, if you remember that this is our basic um, recurrent neural network equation, well, let's consider an easy case. Suppose we sort of get rid of our non-linearity and just assume that it's an identity function. Okay, so then when we're working out the partials of the hidden state with respect to the previous hidden state, um, we can work those out in the usual way according to the chain rule. And then if um, sigma is um, simply the identity function, um, well, then everything gets really easy for us. So only the the sigma just goes away and only the first term involves um, h at time t minus one. So the later terms go away. And so um, our gradient ends up as wh. Well, that's doing it for just one time step. What happens when we want to work out these partials a number of time steps away? So we want to work it out the partial of time step i with respect to j. Um, well, what we end up with is a product of the partials of successive time steps. Um, and well, each of those um, is coming out as wh. And so we end up um, getting wh raised to the lth power. And well, our potential problem is that if WH is small in some sense, then this term gets exponentially problematic. I, it becomes vanishingly small as our sequence length becomes long. Well, what can we mean by small? Well, a matrix is small if its eigenvalues are all less than one. So we can rewrite what's happening with this successive multiplication using eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, and I should say that all eigenvalues less than one is a sufficient but not necessary condition for what I'm about to say, um, right? So we can rewrite um, things using the eigenvectors as a basis. And if we do that, um, we end up getting um, the eigenvalues being raised to the lth power. And so if all of our eigenvalues are less than one, if we're taking a number less than one um, and raising it to the lth power, that's going to approach zero as the sequence length grows. And so the gradient vanishes. Okay, now the reality is more complex than that because actually we always use a nonlinear activation sigma, but you know, in principle, it's sort of the same thing um, apart from we have to consider in the effect of the nonlinear activation. Okay, so why is this a problem that the gradients disappear? Well, suppose we're wanting to look at the influence of time steps well in the future on um, the representations we want to have early in the sentence. Well, um, what's happening late in the sentence just isn't going to be giving much information about what we should be storing in the h at time one vector. Whereas on the other hand, the loss at time step two is going to be giving a lot of information at what um, should be stored in the hidden vector at time step one. So the end result of that is that what happens is that these simple RNNs are very good at modeling nearby effects, but they're not good at all at modeling long-term effects because the gradient signal from far away is just lost too much. And therefore the model never effectively gets to learn um, what information from far away it would be useful to preserve into the future. So let's consider that concretely um, for the example of language models that we've worked on. So here's a piece of text. Um, when she tried to print her tickets, she found that the printer was out of toner. She went to the stationery store to buy more toner. It was very overpriced. After installing the toner into the printer, she finally printed her, 
And well, you're all smart human beings. I trust you can all guess what the word that comes next is. It should be tickets. Um, but well, the problem is that for the RNN to start to learn cases like this, it would have to carry through in its hidden state a memory of the word tickets for sort of whatever it is, about 30 hidden state updates. And well, we'll train on this um, example. And so we'll be wanting it to predict tickets um, is the next word. And so a gradient update will be sent right back through the hidden states of the LSTM corresponding to this sentence. And that should tell the model, um, it's good to preserve information about the word tickets because that might be useful in the future. Here it was useful in the future. Um, but the problem is that the gradient signal will just become far too weak out of after a bunch of words, and it just never learns that dependency. Um, and so what we find in practice is the model is just unable to predict similar long distance dependencies at test time. I've spent quite a long time on vanishing gradients and in really vanishing gradients are the big problem in practice um, with using um, recurrent neural networks over long sequences. Um, but, you know, I have to do justice to the fact that you can actually also have the opposite problem. You can also have exploding gradients. So if a gradient becomes too big, that's also a problem. And it's a problem because the stochastic gradient update step becomes too big, right? So remember that our parameter update is um, based on the product of the learning rate and the gradient. So if your gradient is huge, right, you've calculated, oh, it's got a lot of slope here. This has a slope of 10,000. Um, then your parameter update can be arbitrarily large. And that's potentially problematic. That can cause a bad update where you take a huge step and you end up at a weird and bad parameter configuration. So you sort of think you're coming up with a, to a steep hill to climb and well, you wanna be climbing the hill to high likelihood, but actually the gradient is so sleep, steep that you make an enormous um, um, update and then suddenly your parameters are over in Iowa and you've lost your hill altogether. There's also the practical difficulty that we only have so much resolution now, floating point numbers. Um, so um, if your gradient gets too steep, um, you start getting um, not a numbers in your calculations, which ruin all your hard training work. Um, we use a kind of an easy fix to this, which is called gradient clipping, um, which is we choose some reasonable number and we say, we're just not gonna deal with gradients that are bigger than this number. Um, a commonly used number is 20. You know, some thing that's got a range of spread, but not that high, you know, you can use 10, 100, some we're sort of in that range. Um, and if the norm of the gradient is greater than that threshold, we simply just scale it down, which means that we then make a smaller gradient update. So we're still moving in exactly the same um, direction, but we're taking a smaller step. Um, so doing this gradient clipping is important, um, you know, but it's an easy problem to solve. Okay. Um, so the thing that we've still got left to solve is how to really solve this problem of vanishing gradients. Um, so the problem is, yeah, these RNNs just can't preserve information over many time steps. And one way to think about that intuitively is at each time step, we have a hidden state and the hidden state is being completely changed at each time step. And it's being changed in a multiplicative manner by multiplying by WH and then putting it through um, a nonlinearity. Like maybe we could make some more progress um, if we could more flexibly maintain a memory in our recurrent neural network, which we can manipulate 
in a more flexible manner that allows us to more easily preserve information. And so this was a idea that people started thinking about. And actually they started thinking about it a long time ago um, in the late 1990s. Um, and Hockreid and Schmidhuber came up with this idea that got called long short-term memory RNNs as a solution to the problem of vanishing gradients. I mean, so this 1997 paper is the paper you always see cited for LSTMs, but you know, actually in terms of what we now understand as an LSTM, um, it was missing part of it. In fact, it's missing what in retrospect has turned out to be the most important part of um, the um, modern LSTM. So really in some sense, the real paper that the modern LSTM is due to is this slightly later paper by Gerge, Still Schmidt, Huber and Cummins from 2000, um, which additionally introduces the forget gate that I'll explain in a minute. Um, yeah, so, um, so this was some very clever stuff that was introduced and it turned out later to have an enormous impact. Um, if I just um, diverge from the technical part for one more moment, um, that you know, for those of you who these days um, think that mastering neural networks is the path to fame and fortune, um, the funny thing is, you know, at the time that this work was done, that just was not true, right? Very few people were interested in neural networks. And although long short-term memories have turned out to be one of the most important, successful and influential ideas in neural networks for the following 25 years, um, really the original authors didn't get recognition for that. So both of them are now professors at German universities, um, but Hochreiter um, moved over into doing bioinformatics work um, to find um, um, something to do. And Gers actually is doing kind of multimedia studies. Um, so um, that's the fates of history. Um, okay. So what is an LSTM? So the, a crucial innovation of an LSTM is to say, well, rather than just having one hidden vector in the recurrent model, we're going to um, build a model with two um, hidden vectors at each time step, one of which is still called the hidden state H and the other of which is called the cell state. Um, now, you know, arguably in retrospect, these were named wrongly because as you'll see when we look at it in more detail, in some sense, the cell is more equivalent to the hidden state of the simple RNN than vice versa, but we're just going with the names that everybody uses. So both of these are vectors of length N um, and it's going to be the cell that stores long-term information. Um, and so we want to have something that's more like memory. So the meaning like RAM in a computer. Um, so the cell is designed so you can read from it, you can erase parts of it, and you can write new information to the cell. Um, and the interesting part of an LSTM is then it's got control structures to decide how you do that. So the selection of which information to erase, write and read is controlled by probabilistic gates. So the gates are also vectors of length N and on each time step, um, we work out a state for the gate vectors. So each element of the gate vectors is a probability. So they can be open probability one, closed probability zero, or somewhere in between. And their value will be saying, how much do you erase? How much do you write? How much do you read? And so these are dynamic gates with a value that's computed based on the current context. Okay, so in this next slide, we go through the equations of an LSTM, but following this, there are some more graphic slides, which will probably be easier to absorb, right? So we again, just like before, it's a recurrent neural network. We have a sequence of inputs, X, 
um, t, and we're going to at each time step compute a cell state and a hidden state. So how do we do that? So firstly, we're going to compute values of the three gates. And so we're computing the gate values using an equation that's identical to the equation um, for the simple recurrent neural network. Um, but in particular, um, oops, sorry, I'll just, just say what the gates are first. So there's a forget gate, um, which we will control what is kept in the cell at the next time step versus what is forgotten. There's an input gate, which is going to determine which parts of a calculated new cell content get written to the cell memory. And there's an output gate, which is going to control what parts of the cell memory are moved over into the hidden state. And so each of these is using the logistic function because we want them to be in each element of this vector, a probability which will say whether to fully forget, partially forget or fully, <clears throat> fully remember. Yeah, and the equation for each of these is exactly like the simple RNN equation. But note of course, that we've got different parameters for each one. So we've got a forgetting weight matrix W with a forgetting bias um, and a forgetting um, multiplier of the input. Okay, so then we have the other equations that really are the mechanics of the LSTM. So we have something that will calculate a new cell content. So this is our candidate update. And so for calculating the candidate update, we're again, essentially using exactly the same simple RNN equation, apart from now it's usual to use tan H. So you get something that as discussed last time is balanced around zero. Okay, so then to actually update things, we use our gates. So for our new cell content, what the idea is, is that we want to remember some, but probably not all of what we had in the cell from previous time steps. And we want to store some, but probably not all of the value that we've calculated as the new cell update. And so the way we do that is we take um, the previous cell content and then we take its Hadamard product um, with the forget vector. And then we add to it the Hadamard product of the input gate times the um, candidate cell update. And then for working out the new hidden state, we then work out which parts of the cell um, to expose in the hidden state. And so um, after taking a tan H transform of the cell, we then take the Hadamard product with the output gate and that gives us our hidden representation. And it's this hidden representation that we then put through a soft, soft max layer to generate um, our next output of our LSTM recurrent neural network. Yeah, so um, the gates and the things that they're um, put with are vectors of size n. And what we're doing is we're taking each element of them and multiplying them element wise um, to work out a new vector. And then we get two vectors and that we're adding together. So this um, way of doing things element wise you sort of don't really see in standard linear algebra course. Um, it's referred to as the Hadamard product. Um, it's represented by some kind of circle. I mean, actually in more modern work, it's been more usual to represent it with this slightly bigger circle with the dot at the middle as the Hadamard product symbol. Um, and someday I'll change these slides to be like that, but I was lazy in redoing the equations. But the other notation you do see quite often is just using the same little circle that you use for function composition to represent Hadamard product. Okay, so all of these things are being done as vectors of the same length n. And the other thing that you might notice is that the candidate update and the forget input and output gates all have a very similar form. 
The only difference is three logistics and one tan H and none of them depend on each other. So all four of those can be calculated in parallel. And if you want to have an efficient LSTM implementation, that's what you do. Okay, so here's the more graphical um, presentation of this. So um, these pictures come from Chris Ola, and I guess he did such a nice job at producing pictures for LSTMs that almost everyone uses them these days. And so this sort of pulls apart um, the computation graph of an LSTM unit. So blowing this up, um, you've got from the previous time step, both your cell and hidden um, recurrent um, vectors. And so you feed the hidden um, vector from the previous time step and the new input XT into the computation of the gates, which is happening down the bottom. So you compute the forget gate and then you use the forget gate in a Hadamard product here drawn as a actually a, a time symbol to forget some cell content. You work out the input gate and then using the input gate and a regular um, recurrent neural network like computation, you can compute candidate new cell content. Um, and so then you add those two together to get the new cell content, which then heads out as the new cell content at time t. But then you also have worked out an output gate. And so then you take the cell content, um, put it through another nonlinearity and um, multi Hadamard product it with the output gate. And that then gives you the new hidden state. Um, so this is all kind of complex, um, but as to understanding why something as different is happening here, the thing to notice is that the cell state from T minus one is passing right through this to be the cell state at time T without very much happening to it. So some of it is being deleted by the forget gate and then some new stuff is being written um, to it as a result of um, using this candidate new cell content. But the real secret of the um, LSTM is that new stuff is just being added to the cell with an addition, right? So in the simple RNN at each successive step, you are doing a multiplication. And that makes it incredibly difficult to learn to preserve information in the hidden state over a long period of time. It's, it's not completely impossible, but it's a very difficult thing to learn. Whereas with this new LSTM architecture, it's trivial to preserve information in the cell from one time step to the next. You just don't forget it. Um, and it'll carry right through with perhaps some new stuff added in um, to also remember. And so that's the sense in which um, the cell behaves much more like RAM in a conventional computer that is storing stuff and extra stuff can be stored into it and other stuff can be deleted from it as you go along. Okay, so the LSTM architecture makes it much easier um, to preserve information from many time steps. Um, and I've, right. So in particular, standard practice with LSTMs is to initialize the forget gate to a one vector, which it's just, so the starting point is to say, preserve everything um, from previous time steps. Um, and then, it is then learning when it's appropriate to forget stuff. And in contrast, it's very hard to get a, a simple RNN to preserve stuff for a very long time. I mean, what does that actually mean? Um, well, you know, I've put down some numbers here. I mean, you know, how what you get in practice, you know, depends on a million things. It depends on the nature of your data and how much data you have and what dimensionality your um, 
hidden states are, blurdy, blurdy, blur. But just to give you some idea of what's going on is typically if you train a simple recurrent neural network, that it's effective memory, it's ability to be able to use things in the past to condition the future goes for about seven time steps. You just really can't get it to remember stuff further back in the past than that. Whereas um, for the LSTM, um, it's, it's not complete magic. It doesn't work forever, but you know, it's effectively able to remember and use things from much, much further back. So typically you find that with an LSTM, you can effectively remember and use things about a hundred time steps back. And that's just enormously more useful for a lot of the natural language understanding tasks that um, we want to do. Um, and so that was precisely what the LSTM was um, designed to do. And I mean, so in particular, just going back to its name, I, quite a few people misparsed its name. The idea of its name was there's a concept of short-term memory, which comes from psychology, and it had been suggested for simple RNNs that the hidden state of the RNN could be a model of human short-term memory, and then there would be something somewhere else that would deal with human long-term memory. But well, people had found that this only gave you a very short, short-term memory. Um, so what um, Hochreiter and Schmidt Huber were interested in was how we could give um, construct models with long short-term memory. And so that then gave us this name of LSTM. Um, LSTMs don't guarantee that there are no vanishing or exploding gradients, but in practice, they provide, uh, they, they don't tend to explode nearly the same way. Again, that plus sign is crucial rather than a multiplication. And so they're a much more effective way of learning long distance dependencies. Okay, um, so despite the fact that LSTMs were developed um, around 1997, 2000. It was really only in the early 2010s um, that the world woke up to them and how successful they were. So it was really around 2013 to 2015 that LSTMs sort of hit the world achieving state-of-the-art results on all kinds of problems. Um, one of the first big demonstrations was for handwriting recognition, um, then speech recognition, um, but then going on to a lot of um, natural language tasks, including machine translation, parsing, um, vision and language tasks like image captioning, as well, of course, using them for language models. And around these years, LSTMs became the dominant approach for most NLP tasks. The easiest way to build a good strong model was to approach the problem with an LSTM. So now in 2021, actually LSTMs are starting to be supplanted or have been supplanted by other approaches, particularly transformer models, um, which we'll get to in the class in a couple of weeks time. Um, so this is the sort of picture you can see. So for many years, there's been a machine translation conference and sort of bake-off competition called WMT, Workshop on Machine Translation. Um, so if you look at the history of that in, WMT 2014, um, there were zero neural machine translation systems in the competition. 2014 was actually the first year um, that the success of um, LSTMs for machine translation was proven in a conference paper, um, but nothing occurred in this competition. Um, by 2016, um, Everyone had jumped on LSDMs as working great. Um, and lots of people, including the winner of the competition, was using an LSTM model. Um, if you then jump ahead to 2019, um, then there's relatively little use of LS LSTMs, and the vast majority of people are now using transformers. So things change quickly in your network land, and I keep on having to rewrite these lectures. Um, so quick further note on vanishing and exploding gradients. Is it only a problem with recurrent neural networks? It's not, it's actually a problem that also occurs anywhere where you have a lot of depth, including feed forward and convolutional neural networks. 
Um, as any time when you've got long sequences of ch chain rules, which give you multiplications, the gradient can become vanishingly small as it back propagates. Um, and so generally sort of lower layers are learned very slowly and are hard to train. So there's been a lot of effort in other places as well to come up with different architectures that let you learn more efficiently in deep networks. And the commonest way to do that um, is to add more direct connections that allow the gradient to flow. Um, so the big thing in vision in the last few years has been ResNets where the res stands for residual connections. And so the way they're made, this um, picture is upside down. So the input is at the top um, is that you have these sort of two paths that are summed together. One path is just an identity path and the other one goes through some neural network layers. And so therefore its default behavior is just to preserve the input, um, which might sound a little bit like what we just saw for LSTMs. Um, there are other methods that then been dense nets where you add skip connections forward to every later layer. Um, highway nets, um, were also actually developed by Schmidhuber um, and sort of a reminiscent of what was done with LSTMs. So rather than just having an identity connection as a ResNet has, it introduces an extra gate. So it looks more like an LSTM, which says how much to send the input through the highway um, versus how much um, to put it through a neural net layer. And those two are then combined into the output. Um, so essentially um, this problem occurs anywhere when you have a lot of depth in your um, layers of neural network, um, but it first arose and turns out to be especially problematic um, with recurrent neural networks. They're particularly unstable because of the fact that you're do you've got this one weight, ma weight matrix that you're repeatedly using through the time sequence. Okay. So uh, Chris, we've got we've got a couple of questions, um, more or less about whether you would ever want to use an RN, like a simple RNN instead of an LSTM. How does the LSTM learn what to do with its gates? Uh, yeah. Can you opine on those things? Sure. Um, so I think basically the answer is. Um, you should never use a simple RNN these days. You should always use an LSTM. I mean, you know, obviously that depends on what you're doing. If you're wanting to do some kind of analytical paper or something, you might prefer a simple RNN. And it is the case that you can actually get decent results with simple RNNs, providing you're very careful to make sure that things aren't exploding nor vanishing. But, you know, in practice, getting simple RNNs to work and preserve long contexts is incredibly difficult where you can train LSTMs and they will just work. Um, so really, you should always just use an LSTM. <coughs> now, wait, the second question was? Um, I think there's a bit of confusion about, like, whether the gates are learned oh, differently. Oh, or... yeah. So the gates... The gates are also just learned. So if we go back to these equations, um, you know, this is the complete model. And when we're training the model, every one of these parameters, so all of these W, U, and Bs, um, everything is simultaneously being trained by backprop. Um, so that what you hope, and indeed it works, is the model is learning what stuff should I remember for a long time versus what stuff should I forget, what things in the input are important versus what things in the input don't really matter. So it can learn things like uh, function words like a uh and the don't really matter, even though everyone uses them in English. Um, so you can just not worry about those. Um, so all of this is learned and the models do actually successfully learn gate values about what information is useful to preserve long-term versus what information 
um, is really only useful short term for predicting the next one or two words. Finally, um, <laughs> the uh, the gradient improvements due to the, so you said that the addition is really important between the new cell candidate and the cell state. And I don't think at least a couple of students have sort of questioned that. So if you want to go over that again, that might be useful. Sure. Um, so what we would like is an easy way for memory to be preserved long term. Um, and, you know, one way, which is what ResNets use, is just to sort of completely have a direct path from CT minus one to CT and will preserve entirely the history. So that's kind of, there's a default action of preserving um, information about the past long-term. LSTMs don't quite do that, but they allow that function to be easy. So you start off with the previous cell state and you can forget some of it by the forget gate. So you can delete stuff out of your memory. That's a useful operation. Um, and then while well, you're going to be able to update the content of the cell with this, the, the right operation that occurs in the plus where depending on the input gate, some parts of what's in the cell will be added to. But you can think of that adding as overlaying extra information. Everything that was in the cell that wasn't forgotten is still continuing on to the next time step. Um, and in particular, um, when you're doing the back propagation through time, that there isn't, um, I want to say there isn't a multiplication between CT and CT minus one. And there's this unfortunate um, time symbol here. But remember, that's the Hadamard product, which is zeroing out part of it with the forget gate. It's not a multiplication by a matrix um, like in the simple RNN. I hope that's good. Um, Okay, so there are a couple of other things that I uh, wanted to get through before the end. I guess I'm not gonna have time to do both of them, I think, so I'll do the last one probably next time. Now, these are actually simple and easy things, um, but they complete our picture. Um, so we, I sort of briefly alluded to this example of sentiment classification, where what we could do is run an RNN, maybe an LSTM over a sentence, call this our representation of the sentence um, and you feed it into a softmax classifier to classify for um, sentiment. So what we're actually saying there is that we can regard the hidden state as a representation of a word in context. Um, that below it, we have just a word vector for terribly, but we then looked at our context and say, okay, we've now created a hidden state representation for the word terribly in the context of the movie was. And that proves to be a really useful idea because words have different meanings in different contexts. But it seems like there's a defect of what we've done here because our context only contains information from the left. What about right context? Surely it'd also be useful to have the meaning of terribly um, depend on exciting, because often words mean different things based on what follows them. Um, so, you know, if you have something like red wine, it means something quite different from a red light. Um, so how could we deal with that? Well, an easy way to deal with that would be to say, well, if we're just wanting to come up with a neural encoding of a sentence, we could have a second RNN with completely separate parameters learned, and we could run it backwards through the sentence to get a backward representation of each word. And then we can get an overall representation of each word in context by just concatenating those two representations. And now we've got a representation of terribly that has both left and right context. Um, so we're simply running a forward RNN. And when I say RNN here, that just means any kind of recurrent neural network. So commonly it'll be an LSTM. Um, 
and a backward one. And then at each time step, we're just concatenating their representations um, with each of these having separate weights. And so then we regard this concatenated thing as the hidden state, the contextual representation of a token at a particular time that we pass forward. Um, this is so common that people use a shortcut um, to denote that. And they'll just draw this picture with two-sided arrows. And when you see that picture with two-sided arrows, it means that you're running two um, RNNs, one in each direction, and then concatenating their results at each time step. And that's what you're gonna use later in the model. Okay, but um, so if you're, um, doing an encoding problem, like for sentiment classification or question answering, um, using bi-directional RNNs is a great thing to do, um, but they're only applicable if you have access to the entire input sequence. Um, they're not applicable um, to language modeling because in a language model necessarily you have to generate the next word based on only the preceding context. Um, but if you do have the entire input sequence, that bidirectionality gives you greater power. And indeed, that's been an idea that people have built on in subsequent work. So um, when we get to transformers in a couple of weeks, um, we'll spend plenty of time on the BERT model um, where that acronym stands for bidirectional encoder representations from transformers. So part of what's, um, important in that model is the transformer, but really a central point of the paper was to say that you could build more powerful models using transformers by again, um, exploiting um, bidirectionality. Okay, um, there's one teeny bit left on RNNs, um, but I'll sneak it into next class and I'll call it the end for today. And if there are other things you'd like to ask questions about, um, you can find me on Nooks again in just in just a minute. Okay, so um, see you again next Tuesday.